Alright guys, Dominic here for KitGuru, and after checking out a few more affordable IPS monitors over the last few weeks, today I am firmly back on the OLED bandwagon as we are checking out the Gigabyte Aorus FO27Q3. Using the same third generation QD OLED panel from Samsung that we saw in the MSI MPG271 QRX, this display is packing a 1440p resolution and 360Hz refresh rate while also claiming up to 1000 nit brightness for HDR. Today then, we're going to put it through its paces and find out whether or not it's worth buying at the £800 asking price. Starting things off then with a look at the design of the FO27Q3, I have to say it is a relatively conventional looking monitor. The front offers a three-sided frameless approach and there is a small chin measuring barely 10mm in thickness. Round the back there is a hint of a gamer inspired aesthetic with some of the design elements and a few sharp angles but I have to say it is relatively subdued overall and it is entirely matte black. Build quality of the stand feels good and the V-shaped foot is made of metal which is always good to see and it measures 54cm across and approximately 27cm from front to back. We do also find a small touch of RGB lighting at the back of the monitor but it's not especially bright and isn't really visible when using the screen from the front. It is good to see however that the stand does offer a full array of ergonomic adjustments. That includes up to 130mm of height adjust, you get 20 degrees of swivel both left and right, there's tilt from 5 degrees downwards to 20 degrees upwards alongside 90 degree pivot functionality so you can use the display vertically if you wish. On top of that, VESA 100x100 mounts are also supported. As for the I.O. then, this is actually split over two main sections on the back of the monitor. On one half we get all the video inputs, so that includes two HDMI 2.1, one DisplayPort 1.4 and then one USB-C that does support DP alt mode and 18 watts power delivery. On the other half we find headphone and mic jacks, there's one USB-B upstream which feeds two Type-A downstream ports as well as the power input. All of the monitor's controls as well are placed centrally underneath the chin with a joystick used to navigate the OSD which is flanked by a power button and a resolution switch button. Speaking of the OSD, this is split into a few different areas with a main setting options but OLED care and game assist in separate tabs. Overall, I have to say it is a very clean and easy to use OSD with a whole heap of options afforded to the user. I honestly don't have any real complaints here, it looks good, it's easy to use and it is fully featured across all the pages and pages of menus on offer, so good job Gigabyte. You can also use the Gigabyte Control Center software to control the screen's options, affording the same level of control as the OSD just in a Windows based environment. Just be aware that firmware updates are done separately with downloadable executables on the Gigabyte website. If you're looking for a new chair, then you should definitely check out Boolies. I'm currently sat on their Ninja Pro gaming chair, which is one of three models from their gaming series alongside the Elite and the Master. So if you're looking for something new to stick in your setup that you can sit on and game and work, then I recommend definitely checking out Boolies.co.uk. That is it for the design though, and now we're going to move on to our panel testing where we use Portrait Display's Cowman Ultimate software in conjunction with an X-Rite i1 Display Pro Plus colorimeter. Now I have seen a few comments questioning about what these different results actually mean so if you do want a quick explainer of how we test and why I have written an article about that over on our written site so that's kitguru.net and I will leave a link to that down in the description below and please feel free any questions on how we test do let me know down in the comments below. Starting our testing though with full screen brightness, this is at default settings but I did switch from the eco profile to standard as the former mode does just limit peak brightness. Still, the results here are as expected for a QD OLED. We see a maximum full screen figure of 255 nits and a minimum of 21 nits. Contrast is of course effectively infinite given that the pixels turn off to display black shades with an OLED screen. There is however a setting in the OSD that can change this default behavior and that's called APL Stabilize. Out of the box this is set to low and that results in a uniform brightness experience regardless of the window size. However, you can adjust this mode even in SDR with the middle and high settings increasing brightness at smaller window sizes. 
Of course, that does mean that you will notice the screen brightening and dimming depending what's on screen, something that I personally find annoying when just browsing the web or whatever it may be, but at least the option is there. As for gamut as well, we can see coverage far exceeding the sRGB space as we'd expect, but then hitting 98.9% DCI-P3 coverage, 96.9% Adobe RGB coverage, and 79.2% reporting of the Rec 2020 color space, and this is pretty typical of a QD OLED screen. As for our grayscale test then, here we're starting with default settings, and that includes the normal color balance mode. This is fairly accurate out of the box, but is just a touch warm with the average correlated color temperature, or CCT, hitting 6,119K, so that's just a 6% deviation from the 6,500K standard. That results in a grayscale average delta E of 3.33, which is generally fine, but not the absolute best. Gamma is also good enough, though it does drop just a little too low in the second half of the curve. Now, to see if I could improve the default color balance, I switched from the normal to the natural color balance setting, but this actually made matters worse, as it's now far too cool, with an average CCT of 7,906K, which is a 22% deviation from our 6,500K target. And that also results in an average grayscale delta E of 6.02, so considerably less accurate than the normal mode. The good news is that Gigabyte does offer manual color balance options and I found that reducing the red channel from 100 to 96 and not changing anything else gives us fantastic results with a new average CCT of 6453K and a grayscale delta E of 1.27. I really don't think that the default normal color balance option is bad at all, but if it is just a hair too warm for you, then this could be worth trying. As expected though, saturation accuracy is not great when looking at results relative to the sRGB space, as we see high levels of oversaturation. Things are improved relative to the DCI-P3 color space, however, with an average Delta E2000 of 2.26. Naturally, that oversaturation has a knock-on effect for color accuracy, and it's as we'd expect. Results relative to sRGB are poor, hitting an average Delta E2000 of 5.17. Once more though, when testing against the DCI-P3 color space, color accuracy does improve to an average Delta E of 2.93, but that's still only middling rather than exceptional. Thankfully, Gigabyte does offer an sRGB emulation mode, and this clamps the gamut to prevent that oversaturation. This mode also actually helps grayscale performance, as the color balance is now not as warm as it was before, with just a 3% deviation now from the 6500K target. Gamma, however, is still too low, and it's actually even lower than it was at default settings, and this cannot be adjusted in the sRGB mode. Saturation accuracy, however, has improved significantly with a new average delta E of just 1.67, and likewise, color accuracy is much, much better, with a new average delta E improving to 1.59 compared to the 5.17 average we saw using the out-of-the-box setting, so it is definitely worth using this sRGB mode. Of course, I did also run through a full manual calibration using Kalman Ultima, and as expected, this improved overall performance to exceptional levels, with near-perfect grayscale and gamma tracking, while saturation and color accuracy also came on leaps and bounds. While we're here as well, I am happy to report that viewing angles are stellar, as you would expect from a QD OLED screen. Just before moving on to our response time testing then, as with any OLED monitor, there are just a few quirks to go over. I'm not going to go into them in heaps of detail here as it is all the same stuff as I covered in the previous MSI MPG 271QIX video. However, that does mean this screen has the same semi-gloss coating without any polarizer and that can result in slightly raised black levels depending on your environment, but if, like me, you game in a dimly lit room, then I don't think this will bother you too much, but it is something to be aware of. Likewise, the sub-pixel structure, although improved from the first-gen QD OLED panels, may still be a problem for some due to text fringing, but again, I have to say, I really don't notice this much in everyday use. And finally, there is always the risk of permanent burn-in with any OLED monitor, though Gigabyte does provide a whole suite of anti-burn-in protections within the OSD that are all aimed at reducing brightness of static elements, plus they do offer a three-year warranty with burn-in protection. For me personally, none of those three issues would stop me buying a QD OLED monitor for gaming, but it does depend on your use case and they are definitely factors to be aware of. 
Moving on to response times, however, as the FO27 Q3 is an OLED monitor, we're not going to focus too heavily on this area as we know the results will be fantastic. Still, I did test the screen at 360Hz with the average response time right around the 1 millisecond mark, and that stays the same regardless of the refresh rate used. Of course, that doesn't mean that motion clarity will be perfect at any refresh rate. The higher you can push the refresh, the smoother things will look. Still, the difference between 240Hz and 360Hz isn't huge, but as I have said previously, I do think it is perceptible. I've also compared the FO27 Q3 against MSI's Oculux NXG253R using its fast overdrive mode. That's a 360Hz IPS LCD, and it is a clear win for the Aorus display in motion clarity with no visible ghosting whatsoever. I don't unfortunately have access to any of the latest 540Hz LCDs, but hopefully that will change in the near future. As for all of our testing means for real world gaming then, for me personally, using QD OLED screens are some of the best gaming experiences I have ever had. For one thing, you get that super crisp and clear motion clarity, which is honestly a real game changer to anyone coming from an LCD. I can promise you, you will never want to go back to 165Hz IPS panel after using this. Even where you can't always drive frame rates up to 360Hz, the inky blacks and contrast from the OLED also helps in any occasion. I've actually been playing a bit of the Callisto Protocol recently after it was free on the Epic Games Store and it is a much slower paced title, but again, the presentation is just fantastic. You get a very vibrant picture due to this super wide gamut on offer and that contrast just adds incredible depth. It's also worth pointing out that the FO27 Q3 isn't officially G-Sync certified, but you can still enable it anyway, of course, and it didn't cause me any issues with my RTX 4090. Of course, we also need to talk about HDR performance, which is a huge part of any OLED monitor's appeal. As it turns out, there's a total of five different HDR modes offered by the FO27 Q3, and I did test them all in the written article over on kitguru.net, but here I'm focusing on the three that I think will have most appeal. The default HDR mode, for instance, is equivalent to a True Black 400 mode with generally very accurate EOTF tracking. You can, however, also use this mode but with APL stabilized set to high for increased brightness, and that changes behavior slightly to make it more like a peak 1000 nits mode with the EOTF tracking rolling off just a bit too early. The HDR game mode is actually the one that differs the most, given its EOTF tracking is slightly too bright across the duration of the curve, but it seems this has been deliberately done for those who want a brighter presentation. As mentioned, the default HDR mode functions like a True Black 400 equivalent in terms of brightness, hitting around 460 nits up to 10% window sizes, after which brightness does drop down. The HDR game mode, however, acts like the peak 1000 nits mode, delivering over 1000 nits for the 1% and 2% highlights before brightness drops down. If you're wondering as well, the default HDR mode, but with APL stabilized set to high, performs equivalently to HDR game in terms of brightness, so I've not plotted it here on this chart just to keep things nice and tidy. I'm also happy to report that of those three modes, default HDR, HDR with APL stabilized set to high, and HDR game, color accuracy is good among them all. Ultimately, this gives you plenty of options when it comes to HDR, all of which achieve slightly different presentations depending on your preferences, and as I always say, I always love to have different options for different use cases. Wrapping up this review then, the Gigabyte Aorus FO27 Q3 is another highly competent monitor from the Taiwanese manufacturer. I guess it would be hard for it not to be good, considering it is using Samsung's third generation QD OLED panel, a technology I have been hugely impressed with ever since its introduction earlier this year. Of course, Gigabyte still had to get other areas shipshape, however, such as factory calibration, general feature set, the OSD, and more, and by and large, I think they have succeeded. The factory calibration is solid, I did find that color balance levels are slightly too warm, but it's nothing major, and this was improved to negligible levels when using the sRGB emulation mode. On top of that, the 360Hz refresh rate offers incredibly good motion clarity. You get effectively infinite contrast ratios from the OLED technology, and personally, I do like the relatively stripped back stand design. There's just no major weaknesses here, and that is a very good thing for any gaming monitor. That being said, there are just a couple of minor quibbles I have with this screen, gamma being just slightly too low for instance, averaging 2.14 instead of 2.2, and then also the USB-C power delivery tops out at just 18 watts, 
compared to the 90 watt figure we get from the MSI MPG 271QRX. Those are very small issues in the grand scheme of things, however, and ultimately, whether or not you should buy the Aorus FO27Q3 comes down to pricing. I say that as Alienware's AW2725DF, which uses the same QD OLED panel, continues to retail at a lower price here in the UK, as it's currently listed at £700. Now, I haven't actually reviewed that screen from Alienware, so I can't recommend it outright, but you just know that overall performance is going to be very, very similar, given it uses the exact same QD OLED panel from Samsung. Still, I am more than happy to recommend the Gigabyte Aorus FO27Q3, as it is a very good monitor that does very little wrong. Just be sure to keep a close eye on the pricing situation if you are determined to get the best deal possible. Anyway guys, that is where I'm going to leave this review, so if you liked it, please do toss me a thumbs up and be sure to let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Please do subscribe if you haven't already and be sure to ding that notification bell so you don't miss when we upload a new video. And if you want to carry on the conversation, why not come over to our Discord server, which is linked in the description. While there, you'll also find links where you can help support us by picking up a cool t-shirt like the ones on screen now. And if you're feeling particularly generous, you could even consider backing us on Patreon. That is it for this one though guys, I'm Dominic for Kit Guru, and I'll see you in the next video.